The SR-71 Blackbird stands as a marvel of engineering, a long-range aircraft capable of soaring 26 kilometers above Earth's surface. At such altitudes, pilots could witness the planet's curvature and the deep blackness of space. Flying at extreme speeds required revolutionary materials and designs to mitigate the immense heat generated by aerodynamic friction. The Blackbird's engines were extraordinary, designed to function seamlessly from a standstill to Mach 3.2. Engineers overcame challenges like cooling, fuel efficiency, and managing supersonic shock waves that disrupted airflow. This advanced technology enabled the SR-71 to evade surface-to-air missiles not by maneuvering but by simply accelerating, outmatching the range and agility of its pursuers. Despite numerous attempts, no SR-71 was ever lost to enemy fire during its missions over Vietnam, North Korea, and Iraq. The aircraft's propulsion system was a feat of innovation. Powered by Pratt Whitney J58 turbojet engines, these engines alone contributed only 17.6% of the thrust needed to sustain Mach 3.2. To achieve such speeds, the SR-71 relied on ramjet principles. Ramjets use the aircraft's forward motion to compress incoming air, which then mixes with fuel, ignites, and accelerates out of the nozzle, creating thrust without moving parts. However, this technology requires forward motion to function and cannot operate from a standstill. The SR-71's propulsion system was a hybrid, combining conventional turbojet and ramjet technologies. The J-58 engines, housed within nacelles, were surrounded by a sophisticated airflow management system. This mechanism allowed a seamless transition between turbojet and ramjet modes mid-flight. The key component was the inlet spike, which could move up to 0.66 meters forward or backward. Adjusting the airflow and maintaining the optimal position of the shockwave between the inlet throat and the compressor. This ensured maximum efficiency by minimizing energy loss due to drag. At subsonic speeds, the inlet spike remained fully extended, but at Mach 1.6, it began retracting shifting 41 millimeters for every 0.1 increase in Mach number to maintain the shockwave's ideal location. The nacelle also featured bleed holes connected to ducts, which initially directed airflow from outside to inside for additional thrust. However, at speeds exceeding Mach 0.5, this airflow reversed, forming a significant boundary layer. The SR-71's ingenious design and advanced systems allowed it to dominate the skies, embodying an unparalleled blend of speed, altitude, and engineering brilliance. The boundary layer refers to a thin layer of air that moves slowly along the surface of an object. By removing this slow-moving air from the SR-71's inlet spike, more room was created for faster, high-energy air to enter, improving the engine's efficiency. Surrounding the J-58 engine was a bypass system that directed air around the engine, helping to cool it and further enhancing its efficiency, enabling the aircraft to fly faster. After passing through the engine, this bypassed air rejoined the main airflow just after the afterburner, providing additional thrust due to the extra oxygen available for combustion, which increased pressure through the ejector nozzle. The bypass system worked through multiple mechanisms. A shock trap or engine cover flap minimized boundary layer buildup, while suction doors opened at speeds between Mach 0 and Mach 0.5 to allow extra air into the bypass for cooling. Air from rear bypass doors, located just before the J58 engine, was also directed into the bypass system. 
The forward bypass doors vented to the atmosphere and regulated inlet pressure. If pressure became too high, sensors would open these forward doors, allowing excess air to escape. Pilots controlled the rear bypass doors to maintain the normal shockwave's position. Mismanagement could lead to a loss of control over the shockwave, causing engine instability or even a surge, where the shockwave escaped the intake, resulting in a sudden power loss. When this happened, the forward bypass doors opened fully, and the inlet spike moved forward to reduce back pressure and stabilize the shockwave. Besides the primary bypass system, six additional bypass ducts diverted air from the compressor directly to the afterburner. This was a key component in transitioning the engine from turbojet to ramjet mode, the afterburner, though inefficient, significantly increased thrust by injecting fuel into the engine's exhaust and igniting it using residual oxygen, allowing for further expansion and power. This design capitalized on the aircraft's forward motion to compress air for the afterburner instead of relying on turbine-driven compressors. While the SR-71's engines were capable of reaching Mach 5 with a pure ramjet, its top speed was capped at Mach 3.2. This limitation wasn't due to fuel costs military operations prioritize performance over cost but rather due to fuel efficiency and payload considerations. Carrying more fuel would have required a heavier and larger aircraft, reducing range and performance. Engineers optimized the SR-71 to carry an extraordinary amount of fuel by using innovative techniques. For example, the aircraft's design eliminated the need for internal weapons storage, freeing space for fuel tanks. A common anecdote about the SR-71 is that it leaked fuel on the ground due to gaps in its airframe. While technically true, this oversimplifies the engineering behind its design. The SR-71 used a system called Total Wing Fuel Tanking, where the fuel was not contained within separate fuel bladders. Instead, the structure itself served as the fuel tank, with gaps sealing only when the aircraft heated up at high speeds, expanding and locking the panels tightly together. This ingenious design balanced structural integrity with operational performance, embodying the remarkable innovation of the SR-71. The SR-71 incorporated weight-saving measures, including using its aircraft skin as the fuel tank instead of separate metal tanks, which would have been too heavy, or lighter plastic tanks, which would melt due to the intense heat generated by aerodynamic friction. Engineers applied sealants to every gap in the titanium skin to minimize fuel leakage. However, because the titanium skin expanded and contracted with each flight, these seals gradually degraded over time, allowing fuel to leak. Regular maintenance was required to reapply the sealants, but completely eliminating leaks was impractical due to the labor-intensive nature of the process. Instead, the SR-71 operated within an acceptable fuel leakage threshold. The SR-71 carried an impressive amount of fuel, comprising approximately 59% of the aircraft's total weight. Depending on its sensor payload, the aircraft's wet weight ranged from 61 to 63 tons, while its dry weight was between 25 and 27 tons. Despite its impressive fuel capacity, the SR-71's range was limited without in-flight refueling, as its engines were highly fuel-hungry. The aircraft's efficiency was also heavily affected by external factors, such as ambient temperature. For example, at 10 deg C above standard temperature, the SR-71 could consume up to 13 metric tons of fuel while traveling from Mach 1.25 at 30,000 feet to Mach 3 at 70,000 feet about 36% of its fuel capacity. If temperatures were 10 dG below standard, fuel consumption dropped to around 7.2 metric tons. 
The SR-71's average range without refueling was approximately 5,200 kilometers, enough for a one-way trip from New York to London. This range, however, was not ideal for a long-range reconnaissance aircraft, as landing in enemy territory to refuel was not an option. In-flight refueling extended the aircraft's operational endurance, with missions lasting as long as 11.2 hours, such as the 1987 flight from Okinawa to monitor the Iran-Iraq War, which required at least five refueling operations. The aircraft's maximum speed was limited by heat. At Mach 3.2, the SR-71's nose could reach 300 DGC, and its engine nacelles ranged from 306 Degsy at the front to 649 Degsy at the rear. These extreme temperatures necessitated the use of titanium for most of the aircraft's structure. Titanium was chosen for its excellent strength-to-weight ratio, resistance to high temperatures, and minimal thermal expansion. While expensive and challenging to work with, titanium allowed the SR-71 to withstand the stresses of high-speed flight. However, even titanium had its limits, which capped the SR-71's speed at Mach 3.2. The SR-71 also required specially formulated JP-7 fuel, which had a low volatility and high flash point to withstand the heat. The fuel doubled as a coolant for critical systems, such as hydraulics, engine oil, and avionics. It was circulated around the aircraft to absorb heat and then burned in the engine when it became too hot. The stability of JP-7 was so high that the aircraft needed a separate ignition compound, trithylberane TEB, which ignites spontaneously upon contact with oxygen. Each SR-71 carried about 16 charges of TB, requiring pilots to manage them carefully, especially during speed changes or refueling operations. The SR-71's black paint, contrary to the typical white paint used to reflect heat, helped radiate heat away from the aircraft. While the black surface absorbed more solar radiation, the frictional heating from high-speed flight far exceeded the heat absorbed from the sun. According to Kirchhoff's law of radiation, a good absorber of heat, like the SR-71's black paint, is also an efficient emitter, allowing the aircraft to dissipate heat effectively. The titanium construction made up 93% of the SR-71 and was crucial for handling the thermal stresses of high-speed flight. While newer materials and manufacturing technologies have surpassed titanium, such as high-performance composites and 3D-printed titanium components with integrated cooling channels, the SR-71 remains an engineering marvel. Its successor, the SR-72, is being developed to reach Mach 6, leveraging these modern advancements. As an autonomous drone, the SR-72 will not be limited by human endurance, pushing the boundaries of aviation further.